Hi, everyone. I'm John Schwartz, climate reporter at the New York Times, where I focus on the ways that a warming planet affects all our lives. In the month of April, my colleagues and I have been guiding you through an online event series called The Greenhouse, focused on the state of the planet 50 years after the very first Earth Day, which launched in April 1970. Earlier this week, we heard from my colleagues Kendra Pierre Lewis and Gal Beckerman as it led viewers through an impressive list of climate books that you should read this year. Today, the discussion will look at what has improved since Earth Day launched and what has actually gotten worse. We're also going to speak with climate leaders, both seasoned and emerging, on what they're hopeful about in coming years. You may submit questions at any time during the event in the Q&A window. Please note, this event is being recorded. I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. I'm here with Dennis Hayes, the organizer of the original Earth Day, who is joining us from his home in Seattle. Jamie Margolin, a founder of the youth climate group Zero Hour, is also joining us from Seattle. And Vanessa Nakate, climate justice activist who formed the Rise Up Movement Africa, is joining us from Uganda. Thank you all for being here today for this conversation. And we'll start with you, Dennis. The story that Brad Plumer and I wrote this week points out that our water is cleaner now. Rivers don't catch fire anymore like the Cuyahoga did more than once in the 1950s and 60s. But oceans are growing warmer and more acidic. The air we breathe in the United States today is cleaner too, but much of the rest of the world has a long way to go. We've stopped the decline of the bald eagle and many other animals, but the Trump administration is working to roll back the environmental protections that saved them and much more. Dennis, what's an example of something that has gotten better? What's worse? And what's the most important as far as you're concerned? Um, oh, that's um, a, a complex question, but let me shoot through it as quickly as I can. Uh, what has gotten a lot better has been my goodness, what just happened to my screen? Am I still on with you? Yes, I believe you are. Okay. Um, and we can break that up. I'm sorry. Let's start with what's gotten better. What, what has gotten better uh, are things that are within our own national borders that can be addressed by acts of Congress and enforced by an environmental protection agency and by uh, the Department of Justice. Uh, as contrasted with things that require international cooperation, where there really is no global legislative body and certainly no global enforcement mechanism. So you were talking about clean air. Um, the smog producing chemicals that come out of tailpipes have now been reduced 98% per mile traveled from where they were in 1970. It's kind of a stunning thing. And, and now electric automobiles with zero tailpipe emissions are no longer golf carts. They are actually high performance attractive vehicles that are not quite commonplace, but moving in that direction. The thing perhaps closest to my heart that's improved has been photovoltaics, solar energy technologies, which have fallen from a cost of about $75 a watt in 1970 to about 25 cents a watt today, at least for utility scale. So that's, uh, <laughs> again, a fairly stunning set of improvements, but they have not been shared globally and of course, in the climate realm, we have an enormous amount to do ourselves. And so what's gotten worse? Well, the stuff that's been getting worse has been the global issues. Uh, many parts of the world now have air pollution that is as bad or worse than it was in Gary, Indiana, and Pittsburgh, and Los Angeles back in 1970. Um, there has been a mounting uh, degree of poverty in big chunks of the world where uh, most environmental things fall disproportionately upon poor people and people of color. And as those populations get larger, then the size of the problems have gotten worse. Uh, I, I think that's been a failure here and, and almost everywhere. And one of the really rewarding things about the Green Deal is that it brings directly into public consciousness that as we move forward with the technological revolution, literally replacing the entire energy infrastructure of industrial civilization, that we recognize that that will have massive distributional impacts. You know, when you have a revolution, the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, the, the digital revolution, the big ones, 
you always come out with pharaohs and industrial titans and gazillionaires. Uh, with this one, the potential for that kind of differential between the fabulously wealthy and the absolutely destitute is, is enormous. And I'm, I'm just delighted that the Green New Deal people have chosen to address that right from the start. It's tremendous. And then uh, is there one thing that you feel is most important or have we basically covered it? We've probably covered it. If, if I were to put it in a different context, I, I guess it's that environmental values are now a thing. In 1969, if you'd gone around and talked to people about the environment, they'd, they'd treat you with puzzlement. Uh, there were bird people, there were oil spill people, there were freeways cutting through the neighborhoods people, air pollution people, but they didn't view themselves as having anything in common. And much of the society was not focused on any of those uh, laser-like uh, sub-movements. What Earth Day was all about was to take all of those separate strands and weave them together into the fabric of modern environmentalism. And by the end of 1970, if you'd asked that same question of people, 75% of the people in America characterized themselves as environmentalists. It was just a sea change. And that made possible the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Toxic Substances Control. And that wave of 24 pieces of legislation that fundamentally transformed our society. Tremendous. Jamie, let's look at Earth Day then and now. Could you talk about what the big concerns were in 1970 and what the movement is fighting for now? What, what is different from your perspective? I think from my perspective, it's, it's really the climate crisis is really like the main thing right now versus in the past, it was more of like, like the rivers on fire and air pollution and, and things like that. But, but right now, it's really more about the global climate catastrophe and pretty much trying to prevent um, the end of life on Earth as we know it. Right now, we have this global climate crisis that there's a time limit in terms of solving it. You know, my organization isn't called Zero Hour for fun. It's called that because we literally have zero hours left to act on the climate crisis. And right now we're in a place where um, the earth is, is really on a, on a small timetable and we're running out of we're running out of time to solve this crisis fast. And it's something that impacts literally every aspect of life. You know, people always ask me, why did you choose to be a climate activist over every issue? And I say, I'm not a single issue activist. I'm fighting the climate crisis, but I'm fighting for climate justice, which intersects with all other issues. And I think that's something that, that it is even more prevalent nowadays is the way that the environmental crisis has seeped its way into pretty much everything, every other social issue that you can think of. If you care about racism, then you have to care about the climate crisis because um, racist systems are perpetuating the climate crisis and um, making it that some people are more impacted than others. If you care about poverty, you have to care about the climate crisis because it's making poverty worse and affecting lower income people the most. If you care about sexism and women's rights, and then 80% of people displaced by the climate crisis, according to the United Nations, are women. And so you have to address that. If you care about homelessness, you have to address, do you see, like, I could go on like this forever. Um, because I think that, I think that's like really, you know, and this, these intersectionalities existed before then, you know, because if you, the climate crisis, really the root of it is colonization. Um, colonialism is the root of the climate crisis. And, and even before the first Earth Day, indigenous people have been fighting to protect their land and, and the, the Earth since, since literally day one. You know, um, I saw a hashtag that it was like, maybe Earth Day has been around for 50 years, but the resistance in terms of really fighting to protect the land and people from exploitation has been around for 500 years since colonization. So that's great. Um, I so, think now, okay. yeah. yeah, I, I guess to finish off, like I think nowadays people are starting to open their eyes more to the intersectionalities and how you aren't an environmental activist or a social justice activist. You're all, all of them because the environmental crisis does not exist in a vacuum away from our other issues. And it is in fact inseparable from all other social justice issues. That's great, thank you. Vanessa, the first Earth Day was an American phenomenon. The leaders of the movement were predominantly white. Even today, the world's attention sometimes focuses on relatively privileged activists from the developed world. Could you tell us about the need for broader representation, both in the movement and in coverage, and how a moment with a photograph this year at Davos fits in with that? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think that um, in order for us to address the problem of climate justice, we need to 
listen to everyone. We need to look to every part of the world. We need to listen to what every activist is saying. That is the only way that we'll be able to achieve climate justice. For whatever happened in Davos, it, it just showed what has been happening for quite a long time. You know, when I, when I saw that and um, I read everything that had been written, I just thought about all the people who have been trying as much as possible to talk about the climate crisis. For example, Jamie, I, I read her story. I read how much she's been doing and how she started. And I feel like the media has not been so fair to her activism and everything she has done. So basically, uh, there's been a problem of underrepresentation when it comes to how the media handles the climate movement. The climate movement has made to be has been made to be so Eurocentric, hence leaving out different activists and not minding about what they say. I think it's important to listen to every activist because they understand what happens in their communities. If I'm in Uganda, I don't really know what happens in Europe as a, when it comes to climate change. I may just have the statistics of what happens. Someone in Europe won't know what's happening in Uganda. They will just have the statistics that uh, probably climate change affects availability of food for you know, for people in Uganda, but they don't know what happens after that. If a family has no food, what happens? The children won't be able to go to school on a hungry stomach. That means education is affected. Most of the, most of the communities in my country, it is the women who do the work of, you know, all the family chores, preparation of food. So it also increases on the gender inequalities, but no one looks at that. All they care about are the statistics that um, in Uganda, this is being affected because of climate change. But when we look at how much climate change affects people in their specific countries, we see that it's more like an organizational chart, how you have a board of directors, and then you have um, maybe a finance manager or a marketing manager so it is the same thing when it comes to the climate crisis if a drought hits a certain area that means it's going to affect the availability of food for these people and the availability of water for these people what happens when there is no water what happens when there is no food those are the things that can only be explained by the people in those areas so that's well, why this does lead me to this does lead me to my next set of questions uh, starting with you which is let's explore intergenerational activism and how important it is that a movement that is 50 years old survives and thrives with a new generation of leaders. What got you started as a climate activist in Uganda? Becoming a climate activist was a process for me. It is not something that I grew into or I didn't really see any person uh, doing climate activism as I grew up. But I remember in the year 2018, I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community. I didn't know exactly what to do, but I started to carry out research and understand the problems that are faced by the people in my community. And of course, I found quite a number of problems uh, being high poverty levels, unemployment rates, corruption, among others. But I felt so attached to climate change being a problem. This is because in school, climate change is taught as something that either happened in the past or that is coming in the far future, and we don't have to worry about it. But then when I read about it and saw that it was a threat that is happening right now, and reading about its impact, I saw that there are people in my country that were already looking at climate change direct in the face. For example, in the Mount Elgon area, the people who suffer almost every year with landslides, with floods, all these causing destruction and uh, affecting their lives in all these ways. So when I saw that people were suffering as a result of climate change, that is when I decided to start climate activism. That's fantastic. Jamie, your group, Zero Hour, has received funding from the Bullet Foundation, the environmental group yes. run by Dennis Hayes. Why is it important for one generation of activists to help support the next one? Well, I think that, you know, helping um, organizations um, financially is something really important and, and, and I'll, I'll get into like the more general, but I think first things first, an issue that I've seen is that people love to tweet about youth climate activists or activists in general. They love to show their support in a way that doesn't 
actually give resources or, you know, I mean, like, look, a tweet and a shout out, that's, that's help to visibility, spreading the word, you know, that's fine. But I think there's a big problem in people wanting to praise um, certain activists, but not actually fund or support their work tangibly. And this doesn't just go for youth activists, this also goes for any, you know, activists on the front lines, or really just all sorts of different kinds of organizers. And so receiving that support, um, just, just for people watching the context of this is that um, Zero Hour, you know, we are run entirely by volunteers, young, um, young activists, none of us get paid for our work, but we, um, you know, we, we put all our funding into the work that we do. And a lot of times we're living like, you know, it's, it's difficult to actually properly put on campaigns because we never know if we're gonna have enough funding to do the work that we're doing. Um, and so we're constantly applying for grants, trying to fundraise online, and it's really difficult. And so um, we, you know, after Dennis and I live in the same city, we're both Seattleites. So um, after a meeting and, you know, talking about the needs that Zero Hour had, we applied for a grant for the Bullet Foundation and they gave it to us and that was really helpful and that has been helping us carry out a lot of our campaigns um and so it's really important not just financially but also in general that the movements are intergenerational because the youth climate movement may be something that people focus on because you know oh it's impressive that you know young activists are taking such action but we need the wisdom of all generations in order to be able to properly solve this crisis this isn't a matter i don't believe in intergenerational competition because it's not like old people cause the climate crisis young people are saying it's not that black and white because there are members of the older generation like indigenous elders who have been fighting to protect the climate um and to protect life on earth and their land since like day one um there are folks like dennis who have also been fighting uh, for our, our climate so you know it's not about young versus old because not all members like my grandma who grew up um living off the land in colombia she's not you know a cause of the climate crisis she was living out the solution when she was little and so it i don't really believe in like this this pit this intergenerational like fight it, it's not about old versus young it's about forces that are trying to destroy the world versus forces that are trying to protect it and in the when i talk when people say oh boomers you know destroying the climate it's not about all old people, it's about the specific folks in power who, who know about this crisis, who know what's wrong, who, who accept the money from the fossil fuel industry and then continue to make um, the problem worse. And so I think it's really important that we organize intergenerationally in a way that the young people learn from the old folks and the old folks learn from the young people because there are things you know, we can learn a uh, zero hour, we have adult mentors and we learn from them and they learn from us. So it's not like we're being talked. I think youth empowerment is really important, but I also think that, um, you know, generations supporting each other is really important and that we don't, we look at this with some nuance and not black and white because it's some members of the older generation that have caused this, not like, you know, there, there have been indigenous elders on the front lines and, and all sorts of older activists really fighting since day one. So it's- Well, it's well sure. And when you first met Dennis, when you first set up and got that support, you didn't need, you didn't know he was the founder of Earth Day, right? I mean, not I the founder, not. I'm sorry. It's an important distinction. No, he was I the thought. organizer of Earth Day after the inspiration came from Gaylord Nelson, a United States Senator. But, but please, you know, tell me a little bit about that meeting. Yeah, okay, so I, funny story, I actually, I had no clue who I was meeting. I, I don't exactly even remember how this happened, but I think I got, like, a reached out to or something, like, or I reached, I don't even remember. Um, but I, we, we set up a meeting. I was like, hey, I'm Dennis from the Bullet Foundation. We should meet up. So I was like, okay, sure. We went to, like, a restaurant to meet. I brought a fellow organizer of mine because I didn't want to um, be alone meeting someone for the first time and we talked and he was like oh I can support your organization blah, blah blah how can we work together what are you guys doing and he was like really interested in Earth Day I was like hmm why is this man so focused on Earth Day um, and then and then I he gave me a book uh, that he wrote with someone after um, uh, about like um, meat and the and cows and, and the climate crisis that, that he had co-written and I went and looked up his name and it was like Dennis Hayes organizer of the first Earth Day and I was like oh my god I'm so like I just like sat down with this man I had no idea um, and I just thought it was so funny how he's like oh what are you guys doing for Earth Day what are you guys doing for Earth Day I was like why why is he why did, <laughs> and then I realized you know it was there was a reason yeah. The next generation well, was holding up the holiday that he helped start. Which, which, which we're in the middle of now. Now, Dennis, it's easy to think that the first Earth Day caused all that change, all that legislation, all those new uh, regulations, 
by the size of the turnout being intimidating in and of itself, that estimated 20 million people. But there's a big political component too. Uh, if you could give us a moment to tell us about the Dirty Dozen campaign and what that means today for this new generation of activists. Sure. Just, just as a prefatory sentence, I should say, I'm, I'm delighted to hear from Jamie about the intergenerational attitudes. When, when I was a student activist, the common slogan was never trust anybody over 30, which, which I personally abandoned some years ago myself as a philosophy. Uh, but I've now actually had an article in uh, the AARP Bulletin uh, calling for a gray-green alliance between folks who are retired and nearly retired, have time on their hands, have some resources, summoning up the idealism of their youth and finding ways to work with their grandchildren to save the earth. But, but to your direct question, uh, in 1970, we had this massive outpouring, the largest planned and organized event till then in the nation's history. Uh, and one week later, Richard Nixon started bombing Cambodia and then invading it. And a few days after that, some National Guards shot some students, killing four of them, wounding nine at Kent State University. And the environment, which had been front page and above the fold, suddenly disappeared. That fall, we launched a political attack against 12 in incumbent members of Congress with terrible environmental records. Uh, which was actually a fairly easy lift because much of Congress had really terrible environmental records. But we chose folks who had won their most recent elections relatively closely within three, four, five percentage points on their votes, where we had good activist groups that were willing to work in their districts. And most important, where there was an important environmental issue right where they lived that they were on the wrong side of. So, Defeating incumbents in American politics is hard. They've got all kinds of advantages of name recognition and money and what have you. We, we had $50,000 to take on 12 of them across the country. And in the end, we won seven out of the 12 races, including defeating the chairman of the House Public Works Committee, the guy that if you wanted to have a, a public building, a highway, a dam, a prison, uh, you had to get it past his committee. He was, it, it was the pork committee, if you will, of Congress. Um, that was like the shot heard around Capitol Hill. There, you know, we had 20 million people, then we kind of disappeared from coverage. It receded in their memories to, ah, it was a bunch of hippies and picnics and planting flowers and not, not very politically important. When we took out George Fallon, the chairman of the House Public Works Committee, suddenly they thought this is a force that has to be reckoned with. And as a consequence, when the Clean Air Act came up uh, a month later, uh, a, a piece of legislation that would have been inconceivable in 1969 that was opposed vigorously by the coal industry, the oil industry, the electric utility industry, the automobile industry, the steel industry, had not just passed on a bipartisan basis, but it passed the Senate unanimously on a voice vote, and it passed the House of Representatives with only one dissent out of 435. That would not have happened just on the basis of Earth Day. It was a one-two punch. Earth Day and then successful political action. It's, it's amazing and it, and it really rounds out the story. Now looking to the future, the next 50 years, I'd like to discuss what the three of you might be nervous about but also hopeful for in discussion of climate change. Jamie, young activists today are facing a very uncertain future as you've been saying on many fronts. Are there things that give you hope for the future? I mean, really the only hope that we have is an action. So what gives me hope for the future is knowing that I'm not alone in this fight, that there are people out there like Vanessa uh, fighting in, in her community every day and doing everything that she can do, that there are people all around the world doing this work. You know, the, the only thing that, you know, at this point gives me hope is the community and the fact that I'm not alone and that, you know, if I'm feeling really burnt out and I need to rest for a few days, then I know like Vanessa will be out there doing great work. And then if Vanessa needs to rest for a few days, then I'll be out there doing great work. And it's like this, this community that we have around the world of, of, of activists, uh, young and old, from everywhere across the world, all different walks of life, you know, there's, n there's no hope in, in, in no action, you know, so, so if you're just sitting there on your butt not doing anything, and, and we don't change anything, and then someone's asking you, oh, do we have hope to solve this? Well, if we're all just going to sit there and not do anything, then there is no hope. But the only hope that, that we have comes in action. And I think also another thing that has made me hopeful I'm very cautiously optimistic though. I'm not someone who, who's very like, yay, we're gonna, I'm cautiously optimistic, but something that has made me hopeful is seeing like a turn and um, I mean, I know this is slow and with the recent, you know, results of the democratic um, 
you know, nomination for the president. I'm disappointed in how that turned out. But seeing politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Ilhan Omar, this rise of, especially in American politics, like really progressive people who really have a grasp of climate justice. Because for so long, you know, I would talk to politicians and they'd be like, oh yeah, this is like a science problem. But people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, Bernie Sanders understand that this is an issue of justice. Like Vanessa was saying, like I had said before, um, this if, if we want to address poverty, if we want to address any of the other issues, if anyone watching here is going to take anything away from this call it's that, uh, or this video, um, is that this crisis intertwines with everything else that matters and everything else that people care about. And seeing that, that we're starting, it's a very small inkling, but some people in power are finally starting to understand that and the general global community is finally starting to understand that is something that um, gives me uh, some hope or at least enough to keep going and keep working and keep fighting because we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. All right. Um well, this is the last question before we move to the Q&A. Remember, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box below on your screen. Vanessa, there's always something unexpected out there in the world. Now we've got coronavirus. You recently drew links between the coronavirus and climate activism. Tell me about that connection. Well, um, climate change is a crisis and coronavirus is a crisis. Coronavirus clearly shows what we are to expect if climate change reaches its tipping point. When coronavirus first showed up in the world, we didn't give it much attention. Actually, leaders didn't, didn't give it much attention until it escalated and started reaching out for everyone. And what I've seen with coronavirus is not, it is not leaving out anyone. Whether you're high class, or middle class, or low class, it is going after everyone. It is clearly showing us that we are all the same, regardless of where we come from, or regardless of what we own in this world. And climate change, that is exactly what it will do once it reaches its tipping point. Climate change is here, scientists are speaking, activists are speaking, but the leaders remain I mean, they remain deaf to what we are saying because it has not reached that point where it's going after everyone. It is still at the point where no one listened to the coronavirus um, crisis when it had just begun. So that is where climate change is now, affecting the least privileged people and hence it not being so important a topic for the leaders. And then what I've also seen is that leaders are able to listen. It's about their will. You know, they see that their lives are at stake and their economies are at stake. That is why they were so quick to address the issue of the corona pandemic and lock down their economies. But then it just shows that, that the leaders are capable of addressing the issue of climate change. It's about the will. The moment they will, they'll be able to address the climate crisis. Tremendous. Uh now, we're about to move into the Q&A segment with uh, questions from our audience. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, you can submit questions through the Q&A window below, and uh, we've already got some good questions, so I'll start out. Uh, Deborah asks, what should companies be doing now to step up their efforts on climate change, and how do they balance given the impact of the coronavirus on their businesses? And this is open to anyone who'd like to speak. Well, I think first things first, there, there's a few things that needs to happen. One is that certain companies have um, proven that, you know, they're really just in it for like the money, I guess, in terms of the fossil fuel industry, something that a lot of people are unaware of because we're also focused on, on this pandemic, which is totally understandable. We need to be focused on this pandemic. The American EPA, which is honestly at this point, just Trump's oil buddies having a great time releasing restrictions left and right. Um, have recently announced that they are pretty much stopping enforcing all environmental EPA rules indefinitely because of the virus. So they're using this virus as an excuse. It was announced a few weeks ago, I think, but they're using this virus as an excuse to pollute the earth, which is interesting because the, um, 
having asthma or a respiratory condition is a pre-existing condition to feel the worst effects um, of the coronavirus, you know, to be more likely to experience, um, you know, it, the coronavirus affects your lungs. And so if you have a lung problem, then you're more likely to die or experience complications from it. Pollution causes lung damage and asthma and other things. So in the middle of a public health crisis, these corporations have decided to make it worse and make money off of it. So I think some companies like the fossil fuel industry have just proven that they just need to stop existing. Now, other companies are not like that. Um, so I guess with the exception of like the fossil fuel industry and, and other corporations that really, you know, they need to go extinct, like their time is like they've done enough. Um, I, but I think for, for the corporations that aren't really causing the damage, what they need to do, um, I think first things first is, is there has to be a greater systematic change in the priorities of, um, of companies of, of putting, you know, a lot of times the way I guess our system is put is that profit goes above everything else. And then, um, you know, health and everything is all secondary. It's, it's all about the bottom line. And if we can have a general transformation in our economy, which is what needs to happen, where, um, the bottom line is protecting the workers and protecting um, the environment and making sure that everyone is, is healthy and safe and then profit is, is not the top priority. Um, that's really what needs to happen. And I think a lot of companies also need to start, you know, when we rebuild, rebuilding in a way with, you know, renewable energy, um, rebuilding our economy in a way that isn't going back to normal because normal is destroying life on earth. So we don't want to go back. We want to go forward and companies need to start thinking, what can we do um, to move forward? How can we transition to renewable energy? What is our budget to be able to completely transform what we do and how we operate in this dying world? Thanks. So I have another, an anonymous question for Vanessa. How can we in the US help you bring attention to the intersection of the problem with our fellow humans in Uganda? Thank you for that question. The best way and the first way that you can help uh, the activists or the other people in Uganda, because when you help the activists, you're helping the other people because the activists are like the voices of the people who are not speaking up. So the best way that you can help them is by listening to them because you won't understand their problem if you don't listen to them and you won't understand their challenges if you do not amplify those challenges. So that is the first way that you can help them. Listen to them and amplify their voices and get to know what they're saying and what's happening in their countries. It is time for us to start caring for each other because at the end of the day, we are all the same on the inside. And then the other way, you can try as much as possible to, to support ongoing projects of climate activists in different countries or in the African continent at large, because many of them struggle so much to get funding for these projects. So it would be amazing if you reached out and helped them build their projects and bring about change in their communities. Great. Now this sounds like it could be for Dennis or it could be for any of the three of you. Uh, how can we show political leaders who don't believe in climate change that this is a real issue? Well, I, I, I suppose to, to take a first cut at it, um, in the end, you don't have to convince politicians that you're right. You have to convince them that they will lose office if they don't support you. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that there was a magical transformation before the Clean Air Act of 1970 and suddenly people who were aggressively opposed to it uh, sort of had their moment of enlightenment on the road to Damascus and, and saw the, the light. Uh, it was rather that they saw that people were being defeated and they didn't want that to happen to them. Uh, there, there has been, I mean, I'll, I'll be really candid here, some disappointment, much disappointment by climate activists that some of the positions that Joe Biden has taken as the Democratic nominee now for president, um, I would say he's been stronger than Obama was on climate issues, but he's certainly fallen far short of where Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders were, Jay Inslee, for heaven's sakes, on, on climate. Uh, but a little, little home state plug there for Inslee, I, I think. It's, uh... um, but, um, but he's not Donald Trump. And when he gets into office, he'll have a plum book of something like 2,500 people that get appointed. 98% of the things that happen will not be presidential decisions. They'll be made by other executives in the administration, and we want to influence that. 
they will be totally different than the people that were selected by Donald Trump. And if you have a grassroots movement leaning on Biden to do the right things, and by the right things that's moved beyond liberal sort of economic nostrums and saying if you can have a small carbon tax, but, but moving to something that is a major mobilization for a rapid transformation. If you've got the grassroots support for that, it will happen. And if you don't have the grassroots support, it won't happen. And that's why I'm so very encouraged at the youthful activists today that are putting this issue very much at the top of their agendas. Here's a related question from I Mira. Add something uh, to the question. If well, I can. sure, go ahead. So one thing that the coronavirus pandemic has taught us is that there, there's literally no amount of scientific proof that, or just like you could be in a literal disaster and people will still be denying it. In the United States, there have been protests against social distancing of people being like, oh, like the coronavirus actually isn't a big deal. It's like a cold. It's like what, like, you know, even in the middle of a pandemic, which is something even less deniable than the climate crisis, something that is so in our faces, something that is so, you know, obvious that it is on the news 24 seven, that is being way better covered than the climate crisis, that is being way more embraced as a real issue than the climate crisis, that is being more taken seriously. And even then with something this obvious, governments like Vanessa said, still waited to the last minute and now we're all quarantined and people are dying um, because they didn't address this enough. Um, there are people still out protesting that we're even taking action on the coronavirus. And so there's really no, don't waste your breath with these deniers. The biggest problem is not climate denial, it's climate apathy. It's, I know about this issue, but it's really not a big deal. I don't get it. Those people who know about it, but are just, you know, you can sway them. Don't focus on a denier. Deniers are a lost cause. I don't care about them. I don't, put my energy into them. There's really like, y'all can go do your thing in a corner, whatever, go, go, go be uneducated over there. Like I, you know, like it's not something that, that you should spend any time on whatsoever. I think people spend way too much time trying to convince deniers when even if you see the coronavirus, there are deniers in that too. There are people protesting social distancing. There are people complaining, oh, I want to get my nails done. I'm going to reopen like way too early so I can, you know, trivial things. And it's like, there will always be people full of BS. You just got to move past it. Well, it's an interesting point that you make. If you look at the uh, opinion maps put together by the uh, Yale Program on Climate Change Communications and George Mason University, they talk about the fact that the, um, that the, uh, that the contingent of people who absolutely uh, deny that the science of climate change is real, that climate change is happening, is, is really a fairly small chunk of the electorate at this point. And there's a, a vast majority, there's a, first of all, a majority that understands that climate change is happening and that human action is, is the cause. And within that majority, there's a middle that, uh, that is apparently from, the, from these descriptions, uh, ready to listen, persuadable. And so what you're saying is, is, a, is pretty well backed up by the, by the polling data from these, from these experts. Um, a related question from Mira, uh, how do we stop the cycle of oil company lobbying and delay of action? That is uh, the, the corporate interests that try to keep things from moving forward. Well, I'll, I'll take a cut at it, though there's no really good cut at it. Uh, they are enormously powerful. They have had their way now for the last 50, 60 years uh, particularly in those days when Southern Democrats from oil states, from Texas, from Louisiana, from Oklahoma, absolutely controlled Congress by controlling the key chairmanships. Uh, they hire incredibly high-priced lobbyists and they make enormous campaign contributions. So this is not, there's, there's not some easy little tactical fix to this. Uh, but there is something that is going on that's important. One is that shift in public opinion that, um, is, is happening that makes it harder for them to prevail. The second is that a number of other companies, formidable companies with substantial resources are taking the issue extremely seriously at the risk of saying once again, a little bit provincial, but in my backyard, Microsoft has made a commitment by, I think it's 2035 to be carbon neutral, but by 2050 to have gone sufficiently carbon negative that they have more than compensated for all of the carbon that has been released by the company throughout the course of its entire history. And that's, that's the kind of really bold step that we've been looking for from the high tech industry and from other industries. And 
as they get into this, they, they, they begin to lobby on the right side. And I, I think that will, will work. Having said all of that, when you look at the balance sheet of the oil, coal, and gas industries, of the things that cannot be pulled out of the ground and burned if we are not definitely go way past the tipping points on the carbon crisis, it equals something on the order of 50 to $60 trillion worth of resources that become stranded assets. No matter who you are, how enlightened you are as a corporate executive, you can't walk away from an asset that's that, that size. So all of the folks that say, we just got to make the oil companies into energy companies. Um, we've been saying that for 40 years and there's been very close to zero progress. I think what we need to do is slowly shut them down and replace them with disruptive technologies that are uh, brought forward by others. Now, Ella asks for any of you, what is the most important thing we can do in our everyday lives if we're not in a position of power or authority within politics? Well, um, I would take that. I think that the most important thing that you can do uh, regardless of uh, you not having resources is using your voice. Because when I became a climate activist, I really didn't have much. Of course, I was hurt uh, by what people were going through, but I didn't have the capacity or the resources to pay back for what they had lost to try and help their families because I didn't have the power or the money to do that. But then I had a voice that I could use. So I think we don't really have to be in those places of power we can still push for change regardless of the positions where we're at. And the best thing that you can do is use your voice and whatever platform to be able to push for change. I think that really works best if you're not in a place of position and power. I'd like to add to that. Um, a lot of people, uh, Vanessa is 100% right. And I think a lot of people, and I talked about this a lot, um, think environmentalism is about shaming everyone into being absolutely perfectly eco-friendly in your personal life all the time whatsoever and if you're not 100 percent, you don't have the newest electric car if you don't have this that that then you failed and it's really not about individual we're not in the climate crisis because a kid used a plastic straw once you know obviously you know cut back on your plastic intake try to do a more um plant-based diet you know there's all these things that is kind of common knowledge of what you can do but the most important thing you can do is join a movement and join an organization. And with the internet, it's so easy um, to like find an organization in your community to join and really focus towards systematic change. 100 corporations are responsible for roughly 71% of all global emissions, according to um, a fairly recent statistic. And what this means, and of those 100, out of those 100 corporations, the decision makers are like a few people at the top, right? And so a few, a select few of the top wealthy are causing a problem that is hurting huge millions of people and mostly the world's most vulnerable. And so it's a huge problem and, it, and it, it's, it's not going to be solved if we, if we focus on, you know, trying to get too caught up in, oh my God, I accidentally used a plastic fork or the only way that I can be an environmentalist is to recycle. Like I've seen like things like Shell and oil and other oil companies that are like, don't forget to recycle and, you know, try to divert our attention to pointing fingers at each other because we weren't perfectly eco-friendly that one time. It's not about you neurotically being absolutely perfect in your life in terms of making the eco-friendly decision constantly about your own carbon footprint. It's about the whole system is set up in a way that we are trapped using fossil fuels in a way that we are, you know, it's a whole system starting with colonialism is flawed so what we really need to do is what you what the best thing that you can do is join an organization that is focusing on system change if you want to join zero hour you can go to this is zero hour.org to join us or if you want to join vanessa's organization i'm sure she can tell you guys about that too or just google a local organization in your community and join them but focus your energy on systematic change the individual actions are cool keep doing that there's nothing wrong with them but that's not what's going to save us Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Vanessa and Jamie and everyone who joined us for today's session and for your questions. For our final event with the Greenhouse Series next Friday, May 1st, we'll be joined by climate reporter Somini Sengupta as we discuss sustainability in food. That event starts at 1 p.m. Eastern. You can register to our full slate of digital events by going to timesevents.nytimes.com. A recording of today's event and other events in the Greenhouse Series will also be available on that page. We look forward to speaking with you all again. Stay safe and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks everybody.